Good evening and welcome to another TOA talk um, with South America Wine Guide. Uh, this evening I'm going to be talking to Andres Vignoni, uh, who is the winemaker at Vignocos in Mendoza, which is Paul Hobbs winery um, and easily known as, as one of the high-end Malbec producers of Argentina. Uh, so we're going to be really digging into old vine Malbec and looking at some very specific terroirs uh, and sites around Argentina's Mendoza region, which is the main wine region of Argentina. This is all part of our uh, terroir talk series where I'm interviewing a few of the top winemakers of South America. And it's all part of running up to launch their South America Wine Guide book, which will be out soon. So please do make sure to join us for some of these other talks. We've got another one next week um, from Chile. So now I think Andres is just signing in so i'm going to welcome his stream um and he's streaming straight from argentina uh so i'm looking forward to finding out how the vintage is shaping up so far obviously entering into 2021 um after a rather strange 2020 vintage so it'll be interesting to see what he thinks how this will play out uh we're going to be tasting two wines so uh if you have already prepared and have the wines along with us We've got the Zingaretti estate, which is from the Yuko Valley. And we've also got the Marchegiori estate, which is from Luján de Cuyo. So two quite different terroirs in, in Argentina. Um, and looking at some, some of their very specific plots of old vines. And it's interesting, and I think hopefully Andre will, will be able to kind of share some information about this. But you really do get these old vine Malbecs all over um, all over Argentina, not only in, in Luján, oh, let me just add him again, sorry. Um, not only in Luján, which is known as, as the heart of Malbec, but also in the Yuko Valley. Um, so we're going to be talking a bit about the quality of old vines and what makes it special and really zeroing in on these regions. Hi, Andres, welcome. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Happy New Year. How are you? Good, 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 good. Here in, in Mendoza after a while. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you this wine. This of Me too. One of my very... favorite. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this all year, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to start because obviously we're going to really focus on your work uh, with Coos and your vineyards in particular. But I wanted to start and ask you to give us an overview of Mendoza because this is an enormous wine region and often, um, often in England and, and in the US, we, we kind of think of Mendoza as just one, one place uh, and we don't really separate the region. So I wanted to ask you to give us an overview of Mendoza um, and as a Rivadavia boy, an Eastern Mendoza boy, can you perhaps explain the difference between East, um, the kind of central part and the South? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, Mendoza, it's, it's a huge piece of land in, in, in Argentina. And you know what? Depending on where you are, I, I think the mountain, it's, it's the key to understand Argentina, but also latitude is the other key. So all around the mountains, you can find beautiful places from Jujuy, that is top north, to Patagonia. But when we focus in Mendoza, Mendoza has at least four big valleys compared with Sonoma, Napa, or for example, compared with, I don't know, Languedoc, Roussillon, um, Corduron, big places, yeah. So uh, inside that big places, uh, we have uh, Luján de Cuyo as, and Maipú as the first zone. We have Uco Valley as another region very close to the mountain. We have the Southern zone and the East zone in general. So depending on where you are, probably, I would say the first zone and Uco Valley concentrated the most um, recognized wines because of concentration, purity, and, and, and quality. But also the East Zone uh, in, in, in the past was the, the most important place because of the quantity that they can produce there. And obviously, there are also good quality points uh, in, in that region, but it's you know, a little bit farther from the mountains and, and the soils are completely different with less presence of stones and more sandy loamy soils, so deeper soils. And we have more um, days of, of sun there than 
uh, for example, in, in, in Nuco Valley or, or Luján de Cuyo, where you, you have different soil compositions. Finally, the, the South Park, San Rafael, for example, um, it's very low altitude at 600 meters above sea level, but the southern component uh, that make it a little bit cooler and the breeze and, and the rivers and all the thing makes also pretty special the place. So uh, Mendoza is huge and depending on where you are is, is what you can find, even very old vines vineyards. Excellent, super. I think that's a great introduction. And as you say, I think what's so important to kind of get in your head about Mendoza is the proximity to the mountains in terms of soil, temperature, altitude. Um, so we're gonna kind of look at, at Malbec specifically, which obviously Vinyakowos, which is Paul Hobbs's winery, which he started, was it not, I'm gonna, which, when did he start Vinyakowos? Yeah, he started in 98, but the first wine was uh, 99 uh, vintage. Perfect. But he's been working um, in Argentina for, for quite a bit longer. Um, yeah, and... 33 years. Excellent. And, and Cobos really kind of put, helped kind of focus on single vineyard Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon as well. Why is it that Malbec has really thrived in Mendoza? This kind of unknown French variety, which was kind of kicked out of France a uh, hundred years ago. Why, why has it really kind of you know, come to life in Argentina? What is the affinity for the variety that, that the region has? Well, uh, first of all, uh, a lot of French varieties were brought like 150 years ago um, by, by a French guy that was hired for developing the viticulture here. And among them, there was Malbec, Tanat, you know, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, of course, Merlot, and, and all of them. So, uh, all, all the, the vines that th this guy brought, Puget, were prophylaxeric uh, clones. So this is one of the very first, very interesting things about Argentina. We have still a lot of prophylaxeric uh, material around us. So uh, this is the, the first step uh, that you can find the difference between France. France today, I also help in, in a project there in, in Caor, that's called Crocus. And in, and the genetic material, you can see easily, uh, the bunches are different, the, the size of the berries are different, how thick are the skins, and, and everything around that is different. Um, Malbec probably found a great place in Mendoza because of the soil composition that we have, sandy, loamy soils, sometimes a little bit of clay, but very stony, depending on where you are, and uh, a lot of days of sun. So. Uh, the Malbec, the, the cycle of Malbec, that's a pretty long cycle, so it needs a lot of time in the year to get ripe. And Mendoza has all those things, so that's why Mendoza has very well recognized it, not just for Malbec, but also for Cap Franc, for Merlot, for Bonarda, and obviously for Cabernet Sauvignon. Excellent. And it's really interesting your experience working with Cao as well, which is obviously the kind of heartland of, of Malbec in, in France. Can you, in kind of broad terms, explain to us the difference if we're going to taste a French Malbec, how that would taste um, different to an, an Argentinian Malbec? In general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we have a, a great difference in terroir. When, when you go to Cao, you will find a lot of clay. The soil composition is completely different in terms of minerals and things around. And obviously, uh, the, the stones, uh, the, the, the material, the rocky material is different. We have a lot of calcare there that we don't have here. The limestone we have here is just recovering stones that are around the stones, alluvial formations that impact different in the wine. So when you taste side by side uh, a core wine with a Mendoza Malbec, you will find that the Mendoza Malbec probably is rounder, a little bit richer, and in the nose is a little bit more refined. Um, it, more in the, in the red fruit side, sometimes in the floral side, sometimes in the blackberry side, and uh, the cold wine is a, a more uh, link with the black fruit. It's powerful. Tannins are super tight. They're very, like um, big uh, tannins and chewy tannins, and um, it's more about the, a little bit of dustiness or something like earthy. Uh, characters there in, in color. So they're pretty, pretty different. They need more time to get integrated. 
Yeah, I did. I remember going to Cowell, um oh, about seven years ago and tasting, as soon as I'd arrived, about a hundred wines. <laughs> and I, was a, I was quite new as a, as a wine journalist. It was the first time I'd sat down and tasted a hundred wines blind, all Malbec. And, um, wow. and I, I, I learned very quickly why they call it the black the black wine. <laughs> the all my photos visiting the vineyards that afternoon, which just completely, my, my, my entire mouth was black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one big note of difference when you taste a lot of Argentinian Malbec is your, your lips are purple. It's, <laughs> it's the purple wine in Argentina and the black wine in, in Cal. Um, it is, it is. <laughs> and, so, and actually, it's also very related with the, the way they make Malbec because they, they really extract, you know, and it's not just the grapes, it's the, the extraction they get from, from fermentation and all that. They want a very, you know, persistent and inky and powerful wine. Yeah, and, and as you said, the kind of goal are, are wines that you should be opening 10 years later. Whereas I think in Argentina, what's amazing about these wines, and we've got what we're tasting today is four and three years old, but um, which is kind of older for releases in, in Mendoza. But I think, you know, the approachability of, of Mendoza Malbec and its youth is, is a really key difference as well. Um, so I want to ask you about the kind of concept of Bramare and your Appalachian series and how you've sourced these old vines of Malbec, where you found them, what's been the process for, for developing this terroir series? Well, first of all, um, th th this concept of old vines has recently rediscovered because we have a lot of old vines uh, vineyards in Mendoza, but we, we actually haven't paid enough attention since uh, we, we I, I will say we, because there are a lot of Argentinian winemakers that are working in Europe, for example, in, in, Sp in Spain or, or in France or in Italy, and we start seeing that the producers there pay a lot of attention in old vines. So we go back here and say, well, we, we have a lot of them, actually. We, we have to preserve this, this treasure we have. So uh, this wine doesn't start actually based on the concept of old vines, but suddenly we discover that the wines that can really concentrate more purity and at some point more elegance comes from Old Vines Vineyards. And, and it's the case of our single vineyard or vineyard designated wines. For example, this, this two that we will share today, one is from Ucobali, Singaretti, and the other one is from Pedriel that it's located in Lucan de Cuyo. So both appellations, both of the main appellation of Mendoza has several Old Vines Vineyards, and a lot of them are very well kept. So uh, we have you know, Singaretti is at least 100 years. We, we really don't know the date it was planted, but we, we, we already know that it's at least 100 years. And, and this one, uh, Marchiori, is around 80 years old vines. And, and around this region, Pedriel, Lulun, Tagrelo, you can find another small vineyard like Farina, for example, that we are working um, with that vineyard for our Bramari Appalachian, Lujan de Cuso, that are very, very old. I'm very, very nice. So this complexity, that um, elegance, this ap approachability that the wines have has a lot to do with how the old vines impact in, in, in the tannins and, and in the texture of the wines. Excellent. And thinking about the kind of lifespan of, of Malbec vines, at what age do they start to fight? At what age do they become more refined and, and more concentrated? So we're talking about 80, 100 year old vines, which is in incredibly old. <laughs> but at what, yeah. how many years does a vine need to kind of start this journey? And how does it, how does it go? How's the curve of its? Well, I, I will say uh, that from year zero to five, there is no production of, real production of, of grapes. From, from a vine, from year five to 10, you, you can really find very energetic, powerful wines, but with no refinement, the, the girl, you know, you, you can compare a vine like a human life. You know, when you are a child, you, you, you have a, a kind of behavior after you become a teenager and you are super, you know, fresh, but, but you don't have all the concepts together in line. So you, you 
do mistakes, but at the same time, you enjoy a lot. This kind of energy is, is the energy you can catch from this uh, new, new Binance Vineyard. And from year 10 to year 20 is it, it's, it's when the vines start to get ripe and things start to put in place. And when you can get, at the same time, good yields and good quality and good energy. So most of the wines we, we enjoy today as, as top wines has like 20 years old Vines Vineyards or 15 or so. And after 25 years old, the, the yields start to decrease. And you have to be very conscious that if you don't think in, in, in a very top tier, you will start losing money. So you, you can maybe keep the, the vineyard, but the yield will not pay your bills. So that's why a lot of old vines are, are just take out, especially in regions where, where yielding is it's very important. You know, it's part of the business. So if, if you are not very focused in, in what are you producing and you have a very long-term vision or long-term plan, you can really uh, be tempted to, to, to take out the vineyard. And obviously that is a, a very bad thing for quality and for the legacy of the country. But on the other hand, there are a lot of very stubborn people, a lot of Spanish or Italian immigrants that they want to keep their vineyards as, as they thought. And thanks to, to them, we enjoy the, these vineyards today. And, and now our generation is thinking in the future and thinking in planting vineyards that can really resist a hundred years. So uh, irrigation, um, organic, uh, you know, compounds to the, to the place, don't use any herbicides and, and all the things form part of, of this new conception of keeping healthy and, and for a long time the vineyards in, uh, in, in Mendoza. Excellent. I think that's a really useful explanation. Thank you. And, and I also love how you have brought about the, the importance of, of these old kind of vineyard owners who've just kept at it for generations looking after vines. And, yeah. and I think they, you know, deserve our admiration too, because it's thanks to them that, you know, we've got these incredible old vines to work with. Um, can you just give us a, an example of the difference of yield? So if we're looking at, you know, your two wines here, um, 80 and 100 years, how, how does their yield, their production, compare to a 20-year-old vineyard? I, I will say um, that this old vines vineyard produced between three and five to do five tons per hectare. Uh, a, a high-end vineyard, because you can drive a vineyard for high-end quality or for just fair quality, for high-end quality, a young vineyard can produce eight to 10 tons, keeping beautiful quality, so double. And if you want to drive Malbec to a very, very high uh, yield, you can drive it up to maybe 20. So we are talking about a quarter or less than a quarter than a normal yield for Malbec in all vines. Yeah. And that puts it all into perspective, your idea about, you know, costs, <laughs> which is super important. And as a journalist, I never think about costs. <laughs> yeah, no. Because when you have an old vine, you, you can maybe charge 20% more than a normal vineyard. But the yield is a quarter, you know, so it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Super. Okay, so we're going to start focusing in and I want to try and pull up one of the maps that I have here. Um, so the first vineyard that we're going to, what, which order would you like to do this, actually? I, I thought we could start in Luján because it's more traditional um, and, and start there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So maybe you can give us an introduction to Luján and then, and then we can talk specifically about this Machiriori vineyard. Yeah, perfect. So Luján de Cuyo, it's called the first zone, not because it's the best, it's because it was the first zone to be planted with Malbec here in Argentina. And we have here the, the, the most, the, I will say, the most recognized wines uh, from Argentina comes from this region. Yeah, all the big wineries are located uh, in the zone. Uh, obviously, that after Uco Valley shows up, there were some changes on, on the traditional structure. But 
Luján de Cuyo, it's a place where different small places like Las Compuertas, like Pedriel, like Agrelo, and like Vistalba, uh, share some things together. Like uh, they, they are formed by the Mendoza River uh, alluvials uh, that it comes a million years ago. So the soil composition can have sometimes, you know, uh, a little bit of clay, but it's mostly uh, sandy loamy soils, rounded stones with some sediments of calcium carbonate sometimes, especially when you go uh, a little bit uh, closer to the mountains. The, the, the altitude goes from 800 to 1100 uh, meters above sea level. So it's a pretty average and there is no very sloppy. What you can find here is a lot of good days of sun, uh, a, a good uh, average temperature. It's a little bit warm in the day, but very cold in, in the night. So you can ride very well Malbec, but at the same time keeping acidity. And one of the most important things is uh, the, the texture of the tannins that normally are very rounded, very tight and, and very soft. So the Malbec, you, you get in love the world with the varieties, with the varietal, uh, came from uh, Luján mainly in the past. Mm -hmm. So this Mercury Vineyard, it's located in the heart of, of um, Pedriel. Pedriel is a very well recognized stone. This is Marquiori, yeah? This is Marquiori, yeah, right. So here in Marquiori, we have um, Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon mainly. So in the part that is more stony, uh, we have Cabernet Sauvignon, and in the part where the, so uh, the soil is a little bit deeper, we have all vines of Malbec. So we, we take a part for our Cobos Malbec, that is our top tier, and another part for this wine, that is our second wine, that it's called Bramare, uh, in the Mercury Vineyard. There is just uh, a half of Block D1 and a half of Block D2, and it's our foundational wine, actually. It's the very first wine that the, the winery produced 20 years ago. And we can still repeat this, this kind of profile, obviously, with a very different approach. What we have been done in the past year is try to refine it a little bit more, being more respectful with the oak treatment, but also since uh, Facundo take control of the vineyard management, uh, all the leafings and the pruning were very well adapted to this old vines vineyard. So what you can find here is a lot of complexity and you have like rose petals, like white pepper, like um, some sour cherries, mm. some vanilla hints. And in the palette, you know, the roundness in the body of the of the wine you you can almost uh, I, I don't know how to say it but it's it's like very sweet in the, in the palate with, without having any sugar at all absolutely i as soon as i so i opened these just before we started streaming and and it's been sat in the glass but as soon as you pour this to me it just instantly takes me to mendoza i think it's just got that beautiful kind of quite classic profile um, and that, that profile that really made, you know, Mendoza's Malbec world famous is this, this real richness of fruit, um, but the very kind of pretty floral, spicy um, notes that you've just described. And as you said, it's that sweetness in the palate, it, that kind of really juicy, vibrant fruit, um, obviously being a completely dry wine, but that real kind of supple seductive nature that I think you know Luján is for me is all about that kind of soft seduction and just kind of pulling you in and I think you know they're just such beautiful wines that that um that we don't talk about as much nowadays because the Yuko Valley is so kind of trendy <laughs> but I yeah. think Luján really is the is the kind of heart of of Malbec um and it's what made it very famous um can you tell us a bit about the the how you manage the vineyard then so you said that you've been changing the the way that you manage it what, what how do you have to manage old vines what is it how do you treat them differently to to younger vines well first of all you have to be very conscious from the pruning that you can cannot ask the, the same quantity of fruit 
to have a, a very good relation between canopy and fruit. So uh, all, all, all the, the, the pruning you do, it's very conscious about having an, a low yield. That is something that the, the, the plant can really support. The second thing, it's about, you know, the leafings. You, you try to don't be so aggressive to don't take out, you know, green surface that will be photosynthesis at the end of the day to let uh, the plants ripe and obviously covering a little bit with a little shadow the bunches to don't lose the acidity, yeah? And uh, the, the last thing is you have to be very, very patient uh, at the time of picking because the development of tannins and the development, the development of, of ripening that's totally different from a young plant. The, changings, the changes are very slight. So when you, you taste grapes, you have like uh, more time to decide when is the, the best time for picking, yeah? So on the other hand, the good thing about all vines is they have been um, adapted to the place so, for, for so many years that all the weather changes and, and, and all the things are better accepted and you have more consistency in the time compared with a young vine that, for example, if you have a drought or you have a lot of rains in a year, you, you see the impact directly. All vines can really hold better the, the changes. Yeah. And I think that kind of that's a really nice um, your kind of comment about vines being like people. I think, you know, you've got the same kind of thing. The older you get, the more stable you are and the more consistent you are, and perhaps stubborn. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> and uh, and vines seem to do the same. I pulled up this picture of one of your old vines in, in Zingaretti. Um, but uh, what you know, is that they develop these incredible kind of gnarly big root systems um above the ground um is there yeah. anything of kind of looking after the actual trunk of the vine that you have to that you have to do do they sprout out different branches or how do you kind of look after the trunk because i always think they look so incredible um and i wonder you know if they have a different management the actual trunk yeah you know the trunks are, are very different from young trunks because they, they still keep you know, some spores or, or, or things like that, but they, you, you don't have to do much about that. You, you can renew the plant from the spores, but it, it, it's the time that has also killed a lot of, you know, parts of the trunk that, that are just death um, uh, uh, good, yeah? So uh, they seem amazing and their roots are amazing, but a lot of them, has no no impact, just they are structure for, for the part that it's still, you know, running uh, with, with life. <laughs> <laughs> Super, interesting. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna move, so we've come from Luhan, which is obviously the kind of heartland of Malbec. And just to put it in perspective, I love this statistic. I, I've been finishing the book, so like my, I've got all the statistics to my hand. <laughs> But, um, but there's, you know, 15,500 hectares of vines in Luhan and over half of those are Malbec. Um, so 8,000 going on 800 hectares of Malbec, which is more Malbec than in all of France. And, and I just love the idea of, of Luhan being this kind of heartland of Malbec. There's no region with more Malbec than, than Luhan. Um, but we're going to move to the Yuko Valley, which is an enormous region as well. Uh, and I think it's really nice to kind of split it into its its three valleys because it's not just one region, the Yuko Valley. It's it's three really: Tunuyan, Tupungato, San Carlos. Can you tell us a yeah. bit? Pull up the map again. But can you tell us a little bit about how you should think about the Yuko Valley in in terms of separating it? Okay, I, I will think about Yuko Valley not like a political division, as, as you mentioned, as Tunuyan, Tupungato, San Carlos. I think them more like um, in regions divided by altitude. Yeah, I think that from 1300 meters and above, the conditions are, are, are very specific. From 13 to 1100 meters, the conditions are, are different and below conditions are different. So it, it has a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense when you think that all the soil formation or almost all the, fo the soil formation of Uco Valley, it's alluvial. So the closer you are to the mountain, the higher altitude you are. 
the climate has, a, you know, the particularities, but also the soils are mo most sto more stones and, and, you know, poor soils. And, and when you go down into the valleys, you find different situations. So after you, you can have also specific spots like Singareti, that it's in Bizabastidas, that is not very high altitude, but it's like a hole in a valley where all the, the cool air is concentrated, or for example, uh, Altamira. For the, there are a few exceptions, but mostly I think uh, them like in altitude spots. So, um, which I prefer, it's from 1100 to 1300 um, meters above sea level, where conditions are extreme, but not that extreme, and you can concentrate, but also you can ride. Yeah, so wines get a beautiful concentration, but at the same time, they are approachable. And, and that, that's, that's the spot where, where Vinyakovos and, and myself feel better. Do we uh, work with higher altitude vineyards? Yes, but they are not the core of Vinyakovos, yeah? And, and, and after you have this kind of exceptions, that for, from my perspective, Singareti is a jewel in, in Uco Valley. There are not a lot of old vines vineyards in, in, in Uco Valley. And as you can see, Singareti is also surrounded by hills. So we picked in Visa Bastias later than in Gualtazari, for example, because all, all the cool air is stuck in the bottom of this valley, which, which is pretty crazy. Uh -huh. uh, and, and it really marks the, the life of this kind of wines uh, because the, the, the profile of the fruit is completely different from, from the rest of the, the, the places that surround the area. Super, yeah. This, I mean, this for me, this is very much a kind of cool climate Malbec, I think, yeah. in the scheme of, of Mendoza Malbec. And, and I also have really come to love these tiny kind of micro or mesoclimates that you get with you know, your Via Bastia. So I think there's some really nice ones um, in the south of San Carlos in Pampa de Cepillo as well, where they're not necessarily yeah. high altitude. But as you said, because they're in these little kind of basins, really, they, they pool the cool temperatures and, and create these really magical and very feminine wines, I think. Um, so can yeah. you talk about, um, you know, what you're looking for in Via Bastias and how it, for you, how it really expresses itself differently? Well, uh, first of all, we have the, 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 the part of, of the wine that comes from the old vines, that you have this kind of black tea note or the violet notes that, that are amazing. But also, when, when you find a place like that, with the complexity of the soil, the only places, in other words, the soil is real complex, mixing, you know, a, a layer of uh, very dark clay, and after you have sandy loam, and after you have a lot of uh, small stones covered with calcium carbonate on the soil profile it's really complex and, and after you have this kind of old vines so everything comes through uh, a situation uh, an optimal situation for for making a very special wine so after the way making year by year has been adapted to this situation and and not the vineyard adapted to the way making that is a big shift that we have been done in the past five years with vineyard covers is trying to understand what the vineyard want to say to us. So from a block, there is less than one hectare. What we do is three different vinification, respecting the soil um, spots there. They, they change a lot. It's very heterogenic. And my favorite part is the very stony part. I fermented with uh, 15 to 20% of whole bunch. Um, and the fermentation is, is almost like a Pinot Noir fermentation. And the rest, the, the other two parts are fermented like a Malbec. So after a year and a half, I blend the, the parts. The, the, some part is very flowery and it's very expressive and it's very mineral and acid with the other parts that are more gentle, more rounded, um, more sophisticated and, and complex that comes from the, the, the deeper soil parts. So th this kind of way making is something that really passionate me and, and all my team. Um, and, and, and the results are in this, uh, uh, in the sense of very pure noses, very complex noses, and in the palate, a lot of layers and, and, and the wine. And, you know, you, you probably can taste this wine now and it's beautiful, but I would bet that this wine in, in, in a couple of years, maybe 10 years, will be pretty amazing. 
I mean, they are designed for, for that, not, not for now. Yeah. And I, I absolutely, I'm in love with this wine. And, uh, and it, 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 it just keeps giving. It's one of those wines that just keeps expressing every different sip. You get something different. And it's so delicate as well. It's just so many delicate layers of, of very beautiful kind of wildflowers and, and, and even those kind of wild mountain herbs and, and mineral. And I, I just think it's such a pretty, and as you said, it's a much more kind of Pinot Noir style of Malbec. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, that's really interesting. Um, I'd love to know more about your winemaking. So you've, when I visited you last year, you had oh, loads of things going on. <laughs> Um, loads of experiments, <laughs> but what what have been your main kind of like lessons in Malbec? What have you, you know, in terms of whole bunch uh, fermentation, what have been the kind of big changes um, in the years that you've been working with Coros in terms of, of winemaking? Well, first of all, um, five years ago, I, I tried to, to start understanding each vineyard because for, from my perspective, each vineyard needs uh, so much attention to really understand what they want to say to us uh, that I start, you know, adjusting every way, making protocol in, because after I, we decide everything by tasting, but um, to, to each profile. So La Consulta, it's a cool, complete situation than Las Compuertas, and, and we have to be conscious about that. The second step was about uh, adjusting um, the, the barrel selection to each vineyard as well and the toast and the time of, you know, aging of, of, of the oak and all the things. And the forest now, we, we are adjusting everything to forest. Wow. So that is, that is a huge, huge job we are, we are going through. So, for example, I understood very well that Singaretti fits very well with Jupi and, for example, Mercury fits amazingly with Alia and Tronce and, and they, they were made uh, one for another <laughs> so uh, but how how this this characteristics from the wine can be really highlighted by the, the right use of oak and not just about oak uh, because oak is part of the life of the wine and after uh, the, the small things that I have been learning in other countries like for example in Galicia I met a producer that it's really making the opposite things that we are making here or trying to make here is you know uh, biodynamic, but in, in the sense that he, everything is a mess, you know, he forgot every day a lot of things. Um, he's making wine with his hands and everything is dirty and the amphors of clay are dirty and they have, you know, a lot of things that go against myself. But once I taste the wine, the wine was pretty amazing, pretty spectacular. So I, I asked him, what's, what's the key for this wine? And he, he gave me a, a beautiful lesson about micro-oxygenation, for example, on how to do it with amphors. I, I don't use amphors here, but I understood very well how, how I have to do it with, um, I don't know, with a, an oak barrel, for example, and, and the times that they need. So this this kind of small things that you're taking from trips and, and obviously for working in other places or, or for example, Three years ago, I, I finally understood the concept of backbone in a wine, and, and it was amazing because now our wines are thought from the texture, not from the aromatics, not from the, the you know the color or, or, or it's everything about texture, about the backbone, how the wine will live in the time, how how the creaminess of the tannin will impact and thus um, aging or, or, or things like that. So it's super interesting to don't fall in the, in, the, in the, you know, general concepts as minerality. There is a, a, a very open field that nobody has any clue about how the influence of the stones could be related in the wine, but paying attention to the people who's making wine very, in, a, in a very good way from a lot of years and the observation that, that they have had done in their wines it's, it's really amazing for, for understanding and getting experience without passing through a, a, a very long process. So uh, sharing with my partners has been key. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to kind of talk a little bit about your experience as a winemaker, because, you know, what it, what it really excites me about, I should say our generation, because we're a similar age, but what really excites yeah. me 
about this generation of winemakers is that, you know, you're all traveling and working in different regions. And, and you know, with Paul Hobbs and, and with Cobos, you, you are also making wines each year in Galicia and, and kind of tasting with the different projects. Um, what do you think, you know, what is going to be the big impact of, of your generation on the, on the style of Malbec and the future of Argentine wine? Well, first of all, I think that uh, our impact will be not linked to, to um, how to say, to a market requirement because the boom of Malbec hits over. You know, we don't have to continue producing wine just for the U.S. We, we are now producing wine for everyone. Mm-hmm. So we are not tied to a fashion and it's very important. The second thing is we are not tied to any fashion because everyone do as everyone decide. And that's very important because we have, you know, more, more, more feel or more space for the mistakes and the mistakes really teach you a lot. So this uh, kind of options that you can find today are, are linked with that. We, we have no fear and, and, and it's important. And the third thing is uh, that we are very, very generous between the professionals and there is no problem in sharing experiences, come to the winery and taste what we are doing. And I can ask to, to another winemaker, how do you do this? That's amazing. Or how are you pruning? Because I cannot find the way in this place. And I, I notice you are doing it very well or, or wherever. So we are open. There is almost no secrets among us. And, and we have like a friendship that is stronger than just a professional friendship you know it's a personal friendship and that's we will be a legacy that i hope that the future generations can catch and and also be open because it is the way to to really make things better in in a general level yeah to don't have secrets and, and push argentinian category to another place Absolutely. And I think it's so, I, you know, I think when you taste these wines um, of the last kind of five, ten years, I think you see this incredible, incredible journey that Argentina has been on. Um, and you can just taste this kind of leap in, in quality and confidence as well. Like, uh, you know, confidence in the vineyards and the and different styles that you can achieve in different places. Um, I, my last question, because we're, we're, we're running out of time and I know that, you know, we don't want to go on too long, but looking at the wines and I really recommend that people go out there and try them and do this kind of terroir tasting at home because it, it really highlights how incredible, like the difference and diversity of Malbec can be. So with these two wines, um, so we've got our Marcia Giori estate and our Zingaretti estate. Uh, two different Malbecs, how would you kind of serve them in different situations? What would you pair them with? When do you kind of drink them? Is one of them your summertime Malbec? Is one of them your wintertime Malbec? How do you kind of differentiate them in your in your own tasting or food experience? Well, uh, I think the Marchiori with all this this profile, it's, it's perfect for any time, especially for, you know, lunch, and, and barbecues and all the things, but n- not necessarily with the meat. That's actually for putting it in the fridge for maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, open it with your friends before eating uh, and have a taste of a sip of, of this wine that can refresh you, but at the same time you can catch all the aromas and the complexity. So I will not end a meal with this wine. I will start a meal with this wine. <laughs> Always. And- I agree. Always start with the best wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After it's too late. And then work your way down. <laughs> yeah. And um, probably Singaretti, uh, it's a wine that, that needs more attention. But I, I will love pair it with, you know, something like mushrooms or so. Because it, it has an earthy hint, but at the same time a flowery hint that could be very, very, very good with this kind of earthy, but gentle flavors um of, of mushrooms and and you know so vegetarian dishes so uh, i will go for that uh, a, a very uh nice curry for example not over spice it but <laughs> but something like that super sounds delicious well thank you so much. <laughs>
No, you're an absolute superstar. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing some of the secrets of old wine Malbec <laughs> and <laughs> wines. And best of luck for the 2021 vintage. I'm looking forward to seeing how that how that turns out. Is it looking good in the vineyard so far? At least right now they're looking good. So we, we are waiting for the vines. But yeah, now now we are getting into the most important part of the year. And we will see how February and March are, but we are, we are hopeful. Excellent. All right. Well, cheers. And uh, lovely to see you. And thank you so much for your, so much for your time. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Amanda. Espero verte este año. Hope to see you this year. I hope so. Sí. And tell them to open the borders. <laughs> Dale, cuídate. Chao. Chao, chao.